Everybody do the required reading. Show of hands. We're ready to get started. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you know, I want to welcome everybody to the town hall. And just for quick background, if you haven't already seen us in your inbox, uh, Mishti and I are working on Highlighter. And, um, and we build the highlighter to be a place so we can gather and read books and discuss writing together. And these town halls are a way for us to start to bring authors into the mix because when we get a chance to talk to an author, it helps us explore the ideas in an even deeper way and helps us uh, learn and explore even newer ideas and updated ideas and kind of really, really get into the, the details. Um, so this is our first time doing a book launch date celebration. And so congratulations to Nadia, and thanks for joining us on your special day. We're really happy Thank to have you. you. Yeah, to be honest, I wasn't really sure like what I should do for my launch day. So this is like a really nice thing to actually remind myself that it happened and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Moon <laughs> party. Yeah, I mean, there's so many reasons to be excited about this book, but I think one of them is that like you use these really interesting case studies of how people come together to write code to take this kind of deep dive into how people come together online in general and particularly around creators which has been talked about really a lot online these days especially in some previous town halls that we've been having so it's really great connective tissue for us um and yeah thanks again for joining us thanks for having me uh i'm just gonna give a quick note on the format so the magic of the town hall is when we keep it really participating so uh, this is everybody here. Please chime in if you've got ideas and questions. Um, the chat is open, uh, obviously, and then we're going to be pulling from chat to invite people up to uh, you know to ask your question and kind of jam with us directly. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces as I was saying hi and going around the room, uh, and I know you have a lot to discuss about the topics in the book. Uh, so please don't be shy. Uh, this is all meant to be participatory. Awesome. So in the spirit of getting everyone involved, um, why don't we all introduce ourselves in chat by just sharing the name of an interesting creator or creator community that you're following these days. So newsletter, celebrity, anything, um, feel free to chime in in chat. And while we're doing that, I want to call on Tammy from Stripe Press to introduce Nadia. And Tammy has been an incredible force in helping this thing happen in the first place. So thank you. And also welcome, Tammy. Hi all, thank you so much for, for having me and really having Nadia. Um, as as Mishu just said, I work at Stripe Press among other things on, on well at Stripe on among other things, Stripe Press. So Nadia is not a big fan of self-promotion and if you know her, you know this. So I'm going to do it for her. Uh, this, this book, Working in Public, is the culmination of more than five years of really serious research on um, open source production and how it happens. So she's worked at GitHub on developer experience at Protocol Labs on research, and most recently at Substack, working on the writer experience. Uh, she's also the author of a report called Roads and Bridges, the unseen labor behind our digital infrastructure for the Ford Foundation. And that I would say is um, like a precursor to this book. And so I am super excited about working in public. It's one of my favorites that we've published this year. Uh, and specifically because it's, it's I think, nothing short of magical. So um, Kyle Systrom said that uh, social media is in a sort of pre-Cambrian moment in which uh, we are pre-Newtonian moment, although I guess you can kind of sort of substitute either one, uh, in which we know that it works, but we don't know how it works. And I think the particular genius of this book is the ways in which it outlines how our current online realities from um, the rise of platforms and the ways that increasingly individual creators are sort of maintaining them and kind of sustaining them is mirrored and I think really sort of foreshadowed by open source production. So I think the particular, the thing that really fascinates me about this book and how it came to life is that it was motivated by Nadia's observation that around the internet, but particularly in open source, you find often unseen solo maintainers that are responsible for literally trillions of dollars of economic value. So it's my hope that in this conversation, we can surface a bunch of the themes of the book, whether that's uh, the different kinds of online communities that exist and open source projects that correspond to those, 
or the differences between an active contributor and a passive contributor, and, and really what the past 20 years of open source production has to tell us about the future of being online. So with that, I'll let y'all start. But again, thank you all. You can buy the book on Amazon or at stripepress.com. Well, press.stripe.com. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the intro, Tammy. Um, so one thing I like to do uh, to kick these off is to sort of get a little bit deeper on the, the process of how this came to be. So I know that you did the, the Ford Foundation research and you were working at GitHub and meeting lots of developers. I wonder, was there kind of a, a specific moment when you said, this has to turn into a book and there's just a lot that I want to explore here and I want to get it published? Yeah, I mean, maybe keeping in <laughs> keeping in line with um, what Tammy is sort of saying about I hate talking about myself. Um, but uh, so the reason it finally became a book was because um, I was working with a friend slash who kind of became my unofficial editor, although I then got an official editor later on. Um, but he was sort of working with me from the early days, and um, his name's Josh Greenberg, and he uh, he's at the Sloan Foundation and um, has made a lot of grants in a similar space to the stuff that I'm working on um, and has known me like literally since the very beginning. Uh, Ford and, and Ford Foundation and Sloan Foundation work together on a lot of stuff. Um, and so he was just sort of like, I guess, out of the kindness of his own heart was I, I told him that I was working on some sort of like long form thing, but it was maybe like three months into it um, and didn't really know what it was going to turn into. I kind of just trusted if I started writing it. I, kind of figure it out. Um, and I was at Protocol Labs at the time. And so it was, um, I, I kind of had the freedom to be able to just do this, this work as an independent researcher. Um, and then, yeah, so he was like helping me with like, you know, he was like, if you want someone to just sort of bounce ideas off of and uh, write with, um, I'm happy to be that person. And so I finally, you know, agreed to this and shared with him the first draft of everything I had. And I was like, really, really scared to share because I you know, a few months into it, I had not shown anyone or really talked to anyone about what was in it. Um, and so he, we met to talk about it. And he was, he was just like, I hate to tell you, but like, you know, I know you don't want this to be a book, but like, it is going to be a book. Uh, and I was just like, ugh, because I like talked to, <laughs> I talked to people about the book writing process and a lot of authors just sort of, I don't know, it, it sound, it's a, it's kind of an intense and difficult process, like more than I'd really expected, um, mm -hmm. even though I, I write lots of other shorter things, but this was different. Um, and so I kind of, I had already decided in my mind that I didn't want it to be a book, but he, his point was sort of like, there are a lot of concepts in here that are complex and you can't really just break it up into um, blog posts because people will lose that context. And uh, it kind of just requires this more in-depth treatment. Um, and so that kind of convinced me that, all right, I'm gonna make it a book. All right, great. And now that you've kind of gone through the process, it seems like you almost defined or designed your own, let's call it a little bit of an accidental process to eventually arrive at a book. Do you imagine that you would um, you would be excited about taking other work and writing and kind of also do books out of them? Or do you feel like you've kind of, you know, done this one and had that experience? Or how do you think about it going from kind of a, uh, you know, not, not necessarily having a conviction that you wanted to publish a book, now you've published one? Um, yeah, I kind of wonder how the next process will go. I already kind of want to write another one, even though I, oh, <laughs> during the time I, while I was writing, I was just like, oh God, like I can't imagine mm -hmm. doing this again, but now I definitely want to write another one. Um, I don't know when that will be. It was, it, I felt like the book felt like this natural outcropping of, I had already done all this research. I had all these notes. I had so much like, just like working knowledge in my head that I mm -hmm. kind of knew the narrative I wanted to weave. Um, I don't have that deep of knowledge in anything else right now, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> and so I think like if I were to write another one, it would just take some time. Um, I already have ideas for kind of like research projects I want to embark upon yep. uh, next, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet. Cool. So the, the process didn't, didn't end up uh, souring you on, on doing it in the future. You just need to. No, take, take I, <laughs> I mean, I don't have kids, but I imagine it's kind of like what people say about having kids where like right. the parenting process is kind of miserable in a lot of ways, but then you're like so happy you did it. And that's how I feel about like producing this. Podcast. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. That's Hopefully great. it was worth it. Yeah, great. Well, one of the themes that kind of stood out for me, um, and I do want to remind people that you know everybody's everybody's welcome to chime in in the chat or uh, or let us know, uh, you know, if you wanted to to participate. But one of the themes that um, stands out for me is that these tools and 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 services are built on 
for the average user and they're sort of built for the consumer. And you sort of talking about this shift from building these types of tools for kind of a common denominator consumer to really being focused on the creators. And I'm wondering, are there, you know, when you sort of, you give a lot of examples of how that works in the GitHub world. And I wonder if there are like patterns that, you know, what will be the calling cards or what will, what will those look like when we start to see them emerge or people are building platforms that are more creator centric. You know, if you think about average consumer, uh, you know, like a social network would have a profile and a notifications tab. Are there simple um, kind of structures that we could look for to help us identify when something is probably oriented to be more creator focused? As opposed to kind of like the broader community platform kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess some things that kind of come to mind, probably just looking at the distribution of work. That was sort of where it started to click for me when I was looking at open source communities was um, on GitHub, uh, and they're starting to change this now. But uh, yeah, at the time I was when I was really looking at it, um, they if you go to any open source project on GitHub, you can see um, how many contributors there are to that project. So it'll say something like 400 contributors or whatever, some really exciting number. And like some projects like to share this number as evidence of um, look how many people have contributed to this project. But then you can click through and see um, of those contributors what percent of people are contributing. Um, and so if you, it might say like, you know, 400 contributors, but then you click through and it's like, all right, well, the top three people have actually authored 75% of the commits. Um, and that, that, to me, that paints just a very different picture of a 400 person contributor mm -hmm. community versus like, all right, it's actually kind of like three people at the helm and then this sort of like orbit of other, um, maybe more casual contributors that are coming through. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't know we don't have that kind of measure for like every other kind of community or social platform, but um, there are probably ways to get some of that and uh, of like in a given discussion thread or tweet or whatever, like who, how many, um, how many discussions are revolving around like one particular person. So you can imagine like on Twitter, it's like the format is sort of like, I'm tweeting something and then people are replying to me. And so like, I'm kind of setting the tone of the conversation. It's not like, anyone can start a thread that is associated with me in the way that you might on like a community forum where it's just like a board and anyone can kind of like come in and post their topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think kind of looking for those hints of, um, yeah, like there might be a lot of chatter and a lot of conversation, but if you kind of like pull apart some of those threads, like it's, is it really kind of centered around like one person is one person making most of the commentary or associated with or tagged in uh, most of the conversations and that kind of like, I think provides some, some clues. Right. On Twitter, there's this newer feature uh, that was, I think it's only maybe a few months old where you can limit the scope of the audience who's allowed to reply. So w would that be like a canonical example that's kind of newly emergent around a more creator centric uh, tool toolkit? Yeah, I think that one, I, I think the, well, the, the first feature that would come to mind that would be a little bit more creator centric would be like limiting the replies because I think um, that kind of gets to, it's still very publicly visible, but not everyone can contribute back. But then mm -hmm. I think, when I think about um, limiting who can actually, sorry, what was the version that you were saying? I'm getting lost in my- well, I was saying there's there's this feature on Twitter where you can say anybody's allowed to reply or you can say Visibility, only my right. followers are allowed to reply. Right, yeah, so I think like the, like limiting replies speaks a little bit more to that creator centric thing of like publishing for everyone, but limiting who can, um, actually like participate back in the thread. Um, whereas maybe something that would be like limiting visibility entirely where it's like only my followers can even see this tweet in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, to me speaks a little bit more to the club style community that I write about in the book where it's it's more like um, you're, you're actually limiting the number of not just contributors or participants but also the number of viewers. So that actually like changes the shape of the overall community by kind of like shrinking it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of uh, jumping off that, I found your taxonomy really interesting. And this kind of one to many touches on what you call stadiums, where you have different kinds of things going on. Like you might have someone on stage broadcasting to other people, but you also talked about having this like small group effect, which is when people might like form side conversations as they're listening to like a creator on stage, but just cre create their own more intimate experience as that's going on. And I thought that was really interesting because I, I feel like those two experiences don't seem to coexist very well, very often. Like you can imagine newsletters being one to many and you can imagine kind of like niche group chats, private group chats being like these side conversations. But 
what are instances where they are actually bridged well, where you can have both at the same time? Good question. Do do about that? I wonder whether it is being done well at all right now. Like kind of like, as I'm just sort of thinking through it, it feels like um, you might have one parent company that offers different products or like different SKUs, um, but it's hard to think about how it gets meshed all together. And so, I mean, like I'm thinking about um, on Instagram, for example, you can publish to, you know, on, uh, you can publish a post, which like your followers will get in um, their feed or anyone can kind of publicly see if they, if they choose to seek it out. Um, you have stories, which <clears throat> you can also publish out to your followers or publish to like a limited set of close friends. Um, so those are kind of like different ways of engaging with different people. And then you also have like your Instagram DMs uh, where you might have like group chats or one-on-one -on -one messaging. Um, but like each thing is sort of its own separate yeah. product. Um, I think what's maybe like interesting about what Twitter is doing right now with trying to limit replies um, or visibility is like, they're trying to do it all from the same feed. It's not like it is a separate product. And so I'm kind of curious how that is gonna play out. Uh, Cause it is like, I think of like my Twitter DMs are almost like completely different from my Twitter feed. Uh, like on Facebook, I completely disabled my feed and I don't use the newsfeed at all, but I still use Facebook Messenger a lot. And Facebook actually like spun it out into its own product at some point. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to think about like how this thing is actually like integrate into one, one platform. Yeah, because like we just had a town hall with Sarah Tavel, um last week and something that she brought up was this hunger that people have to be involved in more participatory social experiences, which almost seems like it could be at odds with this urge to coalesce around certain creators because the more and more one to many something gets, you could think about it as getting like less and less directly participatory unless people find a way to bridge both of those kinds of experiences for people. And like people in here, like Tom, you have a newsletter, you've probably faced a little bit of this where like, how, how do you guys think about allowing the consumers of your content to sort of interact amongst themselves or even with you in like a more productive way? It's, it's tough. And I think it's, we're email specifically is somewhat constrained by the channel in that, um, you know, it's, it's at least the way that newsletters are designed, it's inherently kind of one to many. And so I think you have to go to a different platform that enables the many to many interactions, um, rather than try to force feed a, uh, that model into a, into a platform that doesn't really want it. I explore some, a little bit of this in the book and looking at, um, open source communities and that, like, some of it, like so much of, when we think about open source project, a lot of it happens on GitHub. It's like centered around the actual code itself and people are like collaborating on that code. But if you kind of think about like what the broader community looks like, people are doing things off GitHub as a platform also and sort of like self-organizing in different ways. Um, and so yeah, maybe the analogy with like a creator centric community would be um, if you have like a celebrity that has like a huge fan base, like they might come to the concert and like watch you and everyone's kind of just like literally looking at you in that moment, but then they might start their own like fan clubs or whatever people do these days uh, where they're sort of like, uh, let's like self-organize and talk about how much we love this person or whatever, or have separate chats. And so uh, even if they're all there for the same reason, because they like love this person, um, they might just go somewhere else to have those conversations. But yeah, I mean, I agree with Tom, like for something like a newsletter in its purest form, it's like pretty constrained to uh, like, I'm sending a post and you can like comment on the post, but everything, any sort of interaction you want to in initiate with other people in this like community that is formed around me uh, kind of has to go through me. So it's kind of like a more, I guess, um, like a stricter interpretation of that. Do you think that's a healthy dynamic to have all the different touch points or does that create itself <clears throat> a type of like uh, over overabundance of uh, kind of needs to participate or, or communicate? If you're if you're, you know, a super celebrity and you actually have notifications coming in on a Slack group or you're part of a bunch of communities that are hitting you on Twitter or, you know, Instagram, it seems like you could end up just creating many different spaces without much control. So do you think that like centralizes somehow? I think it's okay when they're kind of doing their own thing and managing their own thing. Um, and so like with open source projects, you might have, uh, I talk a little bit about like user to user support as an example of this. Mm -hmm. where, they might have their own separate forum. Like, 
you know, the people that are answering the most questions on Stack Overflow about a project might never interact with the code repository itself and never interact with the core developers. Right. They're like their own self-organized thing over here. Um, and I feel like encouraging that kind of stuff is great because you don't have to do anything and they're happy and it doesn't have to flow through you. Uh, in the case of, let's say, like the actual development of code or, um, yeah, newsletters, I think, are still like a good example of this. Like there are times when you kind of want to constrain the conversation and um, and have someone who's like clearly controlling that. Like I think like the reason why I have a newsletter and maybe why a lot of people have newsletters is because Twitter kind of feels like that open free for all forum or whatever your public social platform of choice is. Um, whereas in a newsletter, it's like, I don't, if I never email my list, they're never going to email me. Um, I mean, they could, you know, seek out my email address and email me separately, but like, I don't have to deal with any flurry of activity unless I send out a post and then I deal with that. Um, and so it feels like I'm totally in control of the conversation and I actually like having a place to do that. Yep. Jayashri, do you want to ask your question about online participation? Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi, this is Jayashree. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to say I love reading Roads and Bridges. Uh, that was like that. Go that what that's what got me hooked on to this this whole open source uh, community. Uh, the the value of open source and open community contributions. So I had a question a question around uh, maintenance costs. Uh, so the excerpt had a sentence that said. Uh, maintenance costs are partly caused by poorly defined boundaries around online participation, uh, which haven't scaled to the way we interact with each other. So I was curious if you had any um, examples of uh, any initiatives or companies that are starting to do this uh, or starting to uh, yeah, contribute to this space specifically. Yeah, um, great question. I looked at this a little bit. So just like, I guess, starting on the... Um, open source project kind of side of things. Uh, there are definitely projects that um, are more, are, are clear about setting the boundaries of, I'm the lead developer for this project. And yes, you can submit requests and you can submit suggestions, but like, this is kind of like my project and you're welcome to use it if you want to use it. Um, Closure, for example, I think does a really good job of this. It's maybe like one of the best examples of um, Rich Hickey, who's uh, lead, lead developer is just sort of like, this is not actually a free for all. And if you don't like that, then, you know, don't use closure. Um, he says it much more nicely than that. I'm not doing him justice, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, I think that's sort of like setting those kinds of boundaries. Um, and in, in the book, I explore some examples just outside of open source. Um, there are some communities that do this where everyone can see the post, but not everyone can um, actually post things on them. So product hunt is maybe a good example of this, of, I, I think they they still run this way of, um, Sorry, my dog just found a squeaky toy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna take that away from them one second. <laughs> this is not the first uh, dog incident we had last hey. Tuesday. I had a dog incident myself, so. <laughs> my dog is thrilled that I'm outside right now and doesn't understand why. Uh, so he, he's been like bringing me all these toys to my feet. Um, but yeah, so like product hub being an example of this where uh, you can like view, um, anyone can view the posts that are on there, which help them scale the uh, the activity that they they needed to become really really popular, um, but then they uh, not everyone can actually post a product, and so then you end up having to like go to your friends and asking them or whatever. Um, and so yeah, I mean it, it, you can imagine like if if Product Hunt had never like if they had just made it completely private, which I think is actually maybe one of the the concerns I have about Clubhouse today, where it's like not only is it um, constrained in terms of like who can actually have or initiate conversations, but then it like no one is actually allowed to like listen to those things. Um, and so I, I worry that they are actually kind of going down this trajectory that Product Hunt avoided of if no one can listen to the, the content of the conversations, then it, you have literally just kind of created that like private kind of group chat kind of thing. But um, but you're not balancing the need to make things public and, um, and increase your audience without, uh, but also sort of like managing the contribution side of things. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one because there's, you know, there's um, on Clubhouse, I'd say there's kind of a, a space that has a little bit of a creator, but it doesn't have as much kind of of a single voice the way something like like you know a GitHub or maybe a you know a GitHub kind of creator might have or kind of the major maintainers. Um, so I wonder, are there like evolutions where spaces exist? Maybe a, a more historical version of this might be something like Reddit, where there's spaces that have maintainers. Or kind of admins, um, but is is there anything to learn from the ones that are more space focused versus 
kind of individual kind of creator voice oriented? Um, in terms of like the contrast between space like, versus creator oriented? Yeah, like are, are, okay. are, there, are there things that spaces, you know, having a space, does it relieve some of the problems? Does it kind of have a more natural orientation towards user to user kind of problem solving? relative to you know the platforms that are really about giving somebody a voice or having like a strong kind of creator ethos to it yeah i i think um having this space engenders this idea that people can step down and other people can step up and then you're still like maybe the person that is running um a subreddit like they have moderators and, and people that are kind of like owning these different channels but um if someone leaves and someone comes in like it's sort of like this evolving space over the years that you can imagine. Whereas if a creator kind of steps down, then no one really wants to be in that same space. They can't just like slot in a different uh, a different creator. Um, I think this really points to an, an argument that I make, I make in the book, which is just that like platforms and creators are really, really intertwined for that reason in a way that these more freeform spaces are not. Um, I mentioned like Something Awful as an example where uh, after Something Awful as a forum, which kind of had its heyday and I don't know when it was like let's say like 2005 2010 ish um after it started to kind of like die down like a lot of the core members just went to a different platform so now they're on twitter now they're on facebook it doesn't really matter where they are and i think that's true for a lot of um other communities that are a little bit more platform agnostic like you can imagine if a subreddit got shut down which has happened um those people just find somewhere else to go maybe it's unfortunate it's not on reddit anymore but they can just go somewhere else Whereas a more creator-centric community, I think um, like they just really do rely on the platform a lot more to help set those norms and boundaries uh, and to give them the tools that they need to manage their communities. Are there typical, um, I think there's, there's a question here uh, from Tom about uh, some of the common traits or skills. Tom, did you wanna, did you wanna pop up? Oh, we've got, Oh, hi. Yeah, sorry. I was, I, my mouse isn't working. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, kind of based on what you've seen, both in communities and open source projects, are there common traits or skills that those leaders or, or starters of those projects have that are different than maybe the traditional startup models? Hmm. It's hard to say what has made certain projects super successful over others. And in some cases, I mean, this is probably true of startup founders too. I was gonna say like, sometimes like the sentiment I get from open source developers is a little bit more of this sort of like lovably grumpy, like, I don't know, I made this thing and for some reason everyone's using it and mm -hmm. now I just like keep supporting it. <laughs> and it's this sort of like reluctant maintainer kind of status. Um, and I was gonna say that in contrast to um, a startup founder who like probably has to, you know, put in a lot of work to make sure that people will care about using their thing. And it, this isn't to say that like some open source developers don't, do that as well, but um, but it, so it often seems like accidental their success. But I actually think like that's probably true of a lot of startup founders as well, um, where like you know they created something in their early days because they just really really loved this thing and they really believed in a solution. And then then the kind of longer trajectory of company building and all the stuff that kind of goes into that that is not just sort of like coming up with this solution of something um, as it might kind of early on um, also presents those sorts of maintenance challenges. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, I guess the one, the ones that I think are successful in uh, managing their open source projects well, despite, you know, enormous success and, 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 and inbound that they have to manage um, are the ones who are really good at saying no um, and managing their time and being really ruthless about their time. And that's probably also true for founders and for, I guess, a lot of successful people. Um, and I've tried to sort of take some inspiration from that as well. Um, it's... It, I don't envy the role of any open source maintainer, like even after all these years of seeing them kind of up close, like I just can't believe they handle the stuff they handle as, <laughs> as they do and largely in their spare time, it just still blows my mind. But um, the ones that I think have not let that totally overwhelm them are like, sometimes it really just comes down to like not spending hours helping every single individual person. Like you kind of have to put a little bit of a wall up and you have to put up some processes uh, and yeah, be willing to like close uh, feature requests and things like that just to like get through your day if you don't want it to overwhelm. So um, yeah, I guess maybe something around sort of like that time management and uh, asserting yourself is super, super important. As it sounds like the, 
the um, the prototype of some of these original creators, maybe this reluctant creator who kind of graduates in. Um, and then a lot of these problems emerge. And I think a lot of it becomes problems of kind of managing um, kind of attention, but also managing incentives to make the continued contributions. And you talk a bit about what those incentives look like. Uh, I wonder, you know, I, I, I see Linda here in the audience and she um, thinks a lot about kind of crypto and incentives. And I wonder if there are areas you've seen in sort of open source projects that um, that have handled the incentive problems well, or if sort of has, has that raised any kinds of questions that, that are interesting to explore with Nadia? Um, well, I mean, I think with crypto, it's interesting because it is open source, but then a lot of people are creating projects that have tokens. And so their community inherently is owning tokens. They're incentivized for this to be worth more. So from the start, um, you you have that aligned incentive, but it's also can like completely destroy a community because you like end up having all these people come in that all they care about is money. But when it's done right, it can actually be a really great way to bootstrap. So like Ethereum, I think is a really great example of creating this like huge developer community. But I think like the hard part is actually, and there's no like right playbook here. Like I actually am curious your thoughts of like, do you think that adding a token to this community could like um be a great way to like bootstrap a community or do you think that like that would completely destroy it like i'm just kind of curious your thoughts on that it seems like when so I, we've alluded i guess a couple times to this like taxonomy of communities that i explore a little bit in the book and um and so just kind of leaning back on that on that vocabulary again um i feel like for for like the federation type communities or the clubs. Um, and so those are basically, both of those are um, communities that have a lot of con active contributors and basically just saying, I guess like broadly, uh, people that have a lot of skin in the game um, that are that extend beyond just like the maintainer or the, the kind of leader that's at the helm. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's like super promising to have tokens as a form of ownership because everyone is already really, really excited and wants to be more involved and you're giving them a stake that is um, more tangible and can encourage like especially with sort of like a bigger federation type project where you have lots of people using it and you have lots of people that are excited to contribute to it it just like i feel like the strategy for growth for those types of communities is just like grow like crazy and just like give people as much responsibility as possible um and so giving them ownership i think can also encourage that in the case of something that's more like a stadium type project we're you have one or a few maintainers at the helm and then you kind of have like a lot of people that want something from the project, but they aren't really like meaningfully participating. It's more um, these like extractive contributors that I also talk about um, where it's like, yeah, they're they're mostly just asking for things, but not really contributing value back. Um, then it feels like having more participation or more ownership or more tokens can be maybe like damaging in that case, because it's really more just about like stemming that flow and those people aren't don't really have any sort of like allegiance to your community long term, I think. Nadia, I wonder if you might offer folks on the call just like a breakdown of the different, I guess the taxonomy of the different communities. So explaining the difference between like a federation versus a club versus a toy. Mm -hmm. um, but for anyone who hasn't read it, these terms might seem like they, um, well, there's, there's not context maybe. Yeah, I wasn't exactly sure. <laughs> but, so yes, let, let, I'll kind of go to that. So um, one of the things I, I was just exploring in, in the book was trying to identify like different types of communities and the categories that we can use to talk about it. Because I think like typically when we say, you know, something is a community, we think about um, like a bunch of like, I don't know, I guess what, it, what comes to mind for me is always like people that are like in some sort of like meetup group or they're gathering around a shared interest. Um, and we think of it in, in this, and we talk about in this sort of like flat way of, everyone's kind of like a member in this community. We're all just sort of here because we love this thing. And then from that, then, you know, different people will kind of take ownership and, and step up and do stuff. Um, but I found that term just like really limiting, I think, to think about like community as this broad, you know, flat topic or uh, members as this very flat term. Um, and felt like a lot of the issues that we were seeing in open source um, were because we didn't have more nuanced vocabulary to describe different types of projects. And uh, the theory kind of being that like different categories of communities actually have like 
different growth trajectories and we kind of just need to be a little more nuanced around that. Um, and so what I did was I sort of broke up the, uh, the idea of people that are users of a project um, or and then people that are contributors to a project. So uh, users could also be interchanged with like viewers or um, yeah, anyone that is sort of like looking at the community, but and maybe like casually asking for things, but not meaningfully participating. And it's more kind of like that, that drive by traffic. Uh, whereas contributors are, uh, and specifically like these more active contributors are people that are like really invested and like want to step up and want to be a part of this thing. Um, but I think this like separation is kind of a newer thing of talking about communities at scale because uh, when, yeah, I mean, when, when the biggest a community could get is like a hundred people or whatever, just use kind of extreme examples. Like we just didn't, if, if you were there, if you were showing up to the like church meetups and getting your free lemonade, like someone's going to try to talk to you. Like there's no way to kind of really get out of that. Um, but when we talk about communities online, uh, it's like a totally different kind of scale where you could have millions of people that are sort of very casually interacting with the community, but then there's actually maybe like a much, much smaller subset of people that are, um, that are kind of like stewarding it and, and showing up regularly as members. So, uh, so yeah, I basically split it into, um, is a community experiencing high or low user growth and then high or low uh, contributor growth. And then I use that to define different types of communities. So um, federations are, which I referred to earlier, have both high user growth and high contributor growth. So uh, you can imagine, um, I think somebody's the example of like Wikipedia or something, which is like used by tons of people. And there are hundreds of people that are editing the project. That's like a very, um, it's just kind of like big all around. And their goal is to continue to bring in lots and lots more contributors because they have so many people to draw from. Um, and then you have uh, clubs, which um, Clubhouse is actually probably a good example of this now, um, where you have high contributor growth, but low user growth. So there aren't that many people that can just kind of like casually look in on the thing. Um, but you do have people that are all like very excited about taking a part in and taking, having some ownership. Um, that's sort of like your typical like hobby meetup kind of group that you can imagine. Um, and then uh, let's see, I'm using the matrix in my head. And then uh, we've got um, stadiums, which is kind of like this newer, more emerging um, type of community that I think is like really under discussed. These are kind of the more like creator centric communities where you have, um, very high user growth, but low contributor growth. So for whatever reason, you have this like huge audience of people that are really excited about consuming your stuff, but then like not that many people are actually stepping up to pitch in. And that happens for a variety of reasons. Um, in open source, for example, it might be that the project is um, like too technically complex um, or the code base is like, you know, just not really accessible to a lot of people. Um, a lot of different reasons for this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that a lot of people need to like rely on, but um, but not that many people are contributing back into. And so that's sort of like the focus of a lot of the book is like focusing on this. What does it mean to be this creator centric community? Uh, the last category, which I, I forgot to mention is um, toys, which have both low contributor growth and low user growth. Um, and that's, I'm not, I'm sort of like not, um, not mentioning it uh, in here because it, it's kind of like the, um, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like the earliest stage of a community where you don't really have much proven out in either direction. Um, so is toy always kind of like the proto community? It, everything yeah. starts with toy and kind of grows. That would have actually been a better term to use. I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> proto communities. But yeah. I guess it dovetails on the the famous Chris Dixon, you know, the toys as side projects and those grow into companies and stuff. Um, yeah. With so with these four different types, um, it it makes me wonder. You know, you address some of this in the book um, about how kind of the baton is is passed from one to another, how the creator, moderator, or, or maintainers um, kind of desire for kind of, let's say, the structure or form of governance works. Uh, but I wonder, are there, are we going to see a lot of emergent new governance structures show up? And are they going to end up being specific to the, the types like, will federations all have three flavors of governance and will stadiums end up with one or two? And, and, and will they each kind of end up with with different structures that emerge to help um, to help kind of clarify what is going on and how decisions are made. And will, will that be embodied in software? Is that more going to just be the taste of, of whatever the creator uh, kind of decides? I'm curious to see how it will evolve. Um, the part of, I guess, the argument or the case that I'm trying to make is that they do just like necessarily require different forms of governance based on the type of community that you are. 
Um, I think governance issues come up the most in federations more so than in the other types, just because you have so many people that are um, like coming both in and out of the contributor community and the, that contributor community is, is pretty big. And so most of the questions that we have around governance, um, especially like in crypto, people talk about governance all the time. Uh, and so like, I feel like those kinds of questions like come up for the, are only really even relevant for the federations. Um, like I, I, I've had the experience, I guess, of like a lot of projects asking about governance. And I feel like if you're not really at the stage where you have tons of governance issues because you don't have competing interests or members with different ideas of what they want to do, then it's kind of just sort of a, a non-issue super early on. So that like, you know, in the case of like toys, let's say, like it's just kind of a non-issue. But I also feel like for um, stadiums, like they deal with a different set of governance issues. And I think that community type kind of like lends itself to a slightly more like autocratic um, type of governance where like you only really do have a couple people that one or a couple people that are making the decisions that you know influence the entire project and the conflict comes when you have these casual contributors that come in and say oh i'm a contributor too and like open source is supposed to be for everyone so you know why aren't you listening to my ideas um there's like an example that i cite in the book of this like one maintainer who showed me you know, some, someone was on Hacker News talking about his project and being like, I'm a contributor to this project and I think all this stuff should happen. And he was like, this person has, you know, contributed, <laughs> made one contribution of just like changing a bit of white space in my code. Like, uh, it, that's not a contributor. Like, I'm the maintainer. Uh, it's sort of bizarre that someone should have as much governance say in this project as, as, uh, as I do. Um, and so I think like that's sort of like an extreme example of like why in stadiums, it just doesn't really quite make as much sense to have um, to have those sort of like, like complex governance processes. So I think if we're talking about like developing super like interesting types of innovative uh, governance processes, that stuff is probably mostly gonna happen in the world of federations um, and maybe a little bit in clubs, but like less so on the stadium side. Mm -hmm. So the stadiums are gonna be those autocratic systems and you're going to get get what you get so when um when we look at the um the governance of like a federation you know i think about like wikipedia i think a lot of it was evolved how it grew up based on what they were learning as as it happened um and there's you know in in github uh my understanding is that you know you either have to appeal to the moderator and get your stuff kind of understood there or participate groundswell, or there's kind of the nuclear option of forking. And there's all kinds of trade-offs and problems with that. So are, are there in-betweens there? Are there like shades of gray that are worth exploring that haven't been explored? Or is that just kind of a natural law of gravity for, for how the structure works? So people talk a lot about forking in the early days of open source, especially, I think, because forking was more viable. Um, just because I think we were not, well, for a bunch of reasons, um, but yeah, I'll just kind of start, start by saying that. Um, and I, I will still hear people cite this, and I'm still kind of specifically talking about open source right now, but um, cite, you know, like, well, if you don't like it, you can always just like fork the project, you're welcome to take it. But like at this point, I think now people say it almost tongue in cheek because they know that uh, for a number of reasons, our like dependencies between different projects have become so complex that it's actually pretty hard to fork a project and take it with you. You can mm -hmm. fork it and like, you know, I don't know, just have the code yourself and run it yourself if you want to, but like, it's not the same thing as like, we are actually so much more interconnected than, um, than I think a lot of people want to admit right now. And so, yeah, like the, um, the kind of nuclear option of, of forking is pretty hard to do. Um, there is a little bit of this gray option um, just to bring it up here that um, sometimes people do this sort of like political fork where they will fork the project, but like, they're not really intending to do this long term it's almost more like a petition or something mm. you might think of it as where like enough people are disgruntled and they kind of like can't reach a resolution within the community and so they fork the project to kind of say like you know we're going to start doing this thing over here but the goal is always to get it merged back into the project eventually um it's not it's really more to like make a statement of we're so serious about this that we are starting to make moves off the platform but it's a little bit different from like this more like hard fork where it's like we are actually creating two different projects right now um and so yeah you can see like sometimes forking is actually a path to like resolving things internally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do feel like, I guess most of, I, I feel like in general, like even outside of open source, we place too much emphasis on, um, on exiting and leaving when we're unhappy and 
just less on what it means to kind of negotiate internally. Um, I, it, this is true also just of like social platforms um, more broadly where you all see some sort, of like, some sort of disgruntled user base that is like, well, like, you know, what if we made another Facebook or like, what if we just like made another Patreon or whatever, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And like, I, I think for certain groups of people that have very specialized interests, like, yeah, like it might actually make sense for them to have their own version of Twitter because they are gonna get deplatformed be on Twitter. And like, sometimes maybe that makes sense. Um, but I think it's, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's almost like we're shirking our like active civic duty and participation to say like, well, I'm just gonna leave versus like, let's actually like figure out as like users of this platform and people who are really invested in it um, as creators in particular with like a large stake in, in these platforms future, um, let's figure out like a path forward to make stuff work. So I, I feel like the exit option has gotten most of the flash in like the past couple of decades, but I really hope the voice option becomes something we talk about more. Mm -hmm. I think Andrew had a comment. Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I was I was just saying that there's some interesting work in crypto where um, people are given cryptocurrency depending on how much they contribute, and, and then that allows them to have a bigger say in the governance process or in voting, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, but it's a tough one. Like governance is hard to change over time, and um, I feel like especially in crypto, people are still learning um, the right structure. And in some ways, once you set it in stone it's really hard to change. And so newer models maybe are learning from the mistakes of the older ones. Um, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Nadia, on a, I guess a, you talked about forking and how that maybe leads to some fragmentation. Where do you see things leading over time? With It feels like in the past we had more public Twitter, Facebook, Reddit type forums, and now we're increasingly going to kind of smaller private niche communities. And at least for me, it feels hard to keep up sometimes with the number of communities that are available to join. Um, where do you see that leading over time? I have no, whoa. Can you hear my? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, I cut out exactly when I made my dramatic statement. Um, <laughs> uh, I have no idea where this is going. I was actually going to tweet this question because I am very curious myself. Uh, it feels like I keep coming back to this question over and over again about like where are say like group chats going in long term because it feels like yeah I mean everyone has kind of done like a small version of this but um I mean everyone just keeps like starting more and more group chats and you don't think that much about it because you're like oh we'll just start another group thread or whatever and then some of them catch on but then suddenly I have like you know like 20 different group chats I need to keep up with and like it's just not going to happen like I have a finite amount of attention um long term one, one conversation I had with a friend recently um, who's working on a, in, in this space right now, um, he was just making the point that we all moved to these like messaging apps because it was sort of like the easiest next step. Um, like, so, I mean, like the most popular messaging apps for a lot of these group chats are like, uh, you know, Facebook Messenger, or WhatsApp, whatever. Um, but there's no actual reason why say like we have to be on Facebook or whatever, just because they're a big name, I think in our head, it's like, oh, they must have some sort of like network effect going on here. But like, there actually isn't really, I mean, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier of like, it is more possible for these small groups to pick up and leave and they are much more platform agnostic. Um, and so he was kind of making the point of like, like we should think of that as the like, maybe like proto version of whatever comes next. And like, it's not just that we're gonna be I would be surprised and he was saying he would also be surprised if like we're all just going to kind of be on these messaging apps for the next like five years it feels like that's maybe like the earliest um like prototypical example of everyone is just trying to find a quieter space to go so mm. you know you're on twitter so you just go in the dms but like we're not going to just have these weird scatter chats everywhere for forever like at some point um also just because they weren't really designed for that right like it, like my messaging app is if, if I'm thinking about like, how do I actually create like a home or a space with like a group of people that I really care about? There are a lot of things I want from from that that like are not currently supported by any messaging app that I have. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that space looks like eventually, but I feel like it's a really, really interesting um, just like, yeah, world to, to keep an eye on. I mean, I, I, I just like, especially I think after like publishing this book, I just feel like we are in this next social web renaissance and it's super super interesting and particularly looking around um these sort of like one-to-end communities and then also the kind of quieter group chat sort of space um 
it, it just feels, I don't know. I'm just like thrilled because I feel like people kind of thought after Facebook and Twitter that we were like all done. Um, like all the big platforms have been created, but like it's, it seems very clear to me that we are like in the absolute earliest stages of some other parallel version of the social web that is now rising that is all starting in these like little corners and we can see like okay here's like the early behavior that we have but like let's try to like take that and extend to like what would it look like to have a dedicated group chat app that it like has features that are actually designed for me to like facilitate these smaller conversations versus like me basically just using sms for that um but yeah, I don't have any good answers. I, I've actually been curious about, about that as a starting point for getting to something that helps people kind of discover which connections uh, more. So we talked a little bit about how Twitter is a very wide broadcast and they're sort of having, introducing some new features to slim it down. And I wonder if people started to explore, you know, something like a group chat modality, but made it a little bit more public. Like maybe I can see which chats are going on, but I can't uh, participate directly. I can just see that it happens. So all the communication may be private, but the actual visibility of the existence of it may be a little bit more public. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about like different, you know, I think you need to get the behaviors right and everything. So it's, you know, I don't, I wouldn't propose that's exactly the right thing, but, um, but I'm, I'm very curious about that space. I think there's, there's a lot to explore there kind of coming at it from a different yeah. end. It feels like Clubhouse should be experimenting with that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. If, yeah, I don't know what their direction is long-term, but I would love to see, they were kind of like primed to like, yeah. I think kind of nudge it in that direction. Yeah, that's a cool, yeah. cool beginning. The other direction that I, I think, I, I wonder how we can explore this is like cross-pollination of interests where if maybe we join a highlighter community, if there's a, if there's a neat way to find out, you know, of all the people on this Zoom chat, who else I share some other interests with that we can then kind of, break off to a separate group or, you know, make other connections that way. I think that would be really cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know what the, the path is, but excited for what's coming. Yeah. yeah and, think about and sorry, uh, yeah. go ahead, Nadia. No, go ahead. I was going to say you touched on something really interesting earlier, which is kind of like this eternal problem that we have when we think about our role in civic space in general, something you said something about how, like, do you decide to wrestle it out in this like very messy participatory system or do you peel off and kind of join a smaller niche group where conflict is probably, there's less conflict, but you're also with less people who are different with different views. And that touches on something that a couple of our previous town halls touched on upon as well. Um, last one we did with Bailey and Kevin from Stripe Press also, they wrote Get Together, people brought up the idea of bridging versus bonding communities is something they talk about and what they mean is like communities that are designed to create like very intense in-group kind of connection like a queer women's dinner group for example or something like that versus bridge people who are part of different socioeconomic class race like those kinds of communities um and it seemed i was just curious about what you think about um the kind of the future of how we use online spaces to be better bridging communities or what are productive ways of creating those bridging communities online? Like, are there any? I'm not sure. Because it seems like one possible side effect of the like private group chat silo type spinoffs is you're just in more and more like-minded bubbles and, and there could be some negative side effects to that. Yeah, I mean, to, well, yeah, I kind of like to, thoughts on that. Um, one is, I think, like, the public social web will continue to exist, and it, it'll sure, like, it'll evolve and change maybe too in, in its own ways. But, like, I don't think that, for example, like, Substack is a replacement for Facebook or something, or, uh, like, we need to have, or group chats or whatever. Um, like, I, we need to have a place that is sort of, like, that broad exposure to whoever might kind of stumble upon your stuff. Um, and then you also kind of want this parallel space, which I think is driving a lot of this interest in subscription businesses right now, where it's like, all right, as I've kind of built my audience somewhere, like I want to kind of put it um, somewhere a little bit more private. But I think those two things will kind of work in symbiosis. Um, but then also, I mean, something Andrew said uh, kind of took up my brain a little bit. Um, I was just thinking about this piece that uh, Eugene Wei just put out about uh, TikTok and one of the things he talks about is yeah. like 
the value of an interest graph, uh, interest based graph um, versus your social graph and how TikTok kind of like focus on the interest side of things um, and how that was just like a really different way of organizing versus when you think about like Facebook, for example. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about like what would an interest based <laughs> graph look like for um, group chats, in, including like sort of being able to like enable that discovery because right now group chats are only really being formed around that um, those like social graphs and leading to maybe some of the issues that you're talking about where if we kind of just follow that path long term i'm only really getting soured into like groups of people that i already know or have some sort of like connection with um but what would it look like for me to form that with people i might not know but uh but could have some other sort of shared interest with or, or taste with um i have no idea what that looks like it's kind of hard to it's so hard for me to imagine now just because i think of group chats as being the place where you go when you already have high trust and high context um but like, I'm sure I'm just not even thinking like a few years ahead as to like how that could be possible. There, there must be something there. Yeah, and I think you're right that there's something about creating shared trust. Like in that blog post that he, Eugene published today, he said something about how it's prob people are probably better off just letting strangers uh, self-sort into groups of people who do agree with each other mostly about things instead of like smashing people together in like these gladiatorial arenas right away. <laughs> So like some degree of similarity and trust needs to be built up before productive conversations can happen. And yeah, who knows how that'll kind of start playing out. So there was uh, there was one question that we were we were chatting about uh, a bit when uh, when we first when we first connected, Nadia, where you were sort of asking a question, you know, that you wanted to hear what tools everybody's using and what are sort of the new things that people are getting excited about. I wonder if there's uh, if there's any specific uh, framing of that or something that, that we want to bring up to, to ask uh, solicit people's new tools or excitement about around new communities. Yeah, I could just sort of like uh, reframe. I, I heard most of it, but I was just typing goodbye to, to Tammy. So I, I missed like a little part of it. Oh, yeah. Just that, um, you know, it, in uh, in our, our little pre-chat, uh, you had said that you were curious what kinds of new tools people are using. Are there new chat tools people are using or new um, new mm -hmm. modes of sort of gathering? Uh, and, you know, I sort of asked that as a, an open question if people want to mention in the chat if you have things, uh, you know, new tools that you're using that you think are, are interesting kind of to explore as part of the conversation. Um, we, are, uh, we are kind of running towards the end of the hour here. Uh, so I do want um, to uh, start to to come to closure. And one of the things that uh, we like to do as we sort of wrap is we like to turn the table. So we've spent a lot of time um, asking you questions and we wanna turn the tables and give you a moment to ask us a question or to ask the world a question. And so the the basic format is just what what is on your mind these days? What are the things that you feel are like the underexplored or unexplored areas? And it doesn't have to be specific to you know the the context of, of of what we've talked about, but kind of whatever's top of mind and what are you most curious about? I'm curious about just sort of like the pain points that people are feeling in their own social interactions, and that's a little bit of a broad question, maybe. But yeah, I, I guess like there's always this fear when you write about a topic that you're like, well, I I can write from my own experience. I can even cite other people's experiences, but I'm always kind of filtering it through the stuff that I'm feeling. Um, and so you guys have kind of seen maybe like. The, the the feelings and pain that I'm, I've am i been working through and sort of translating into a, a thesis or an idea. But uh, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering like what is resonating with other people around like what do you love or hate about social media and like the way that you communicate and interact and keep up with people right now, um, including before pandemic life and maybe like during, but um, yeah, where are, where are those sort of like corners that you're kind of poking at where you feel like, oh, I wish I had more of this or I wish we didn't do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, this, this has been awesome. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna conclude uh, and mention a few kind of brief announcements. Uh, so first we have a town hall coming up with Nikhil Basia Trivedi uh, talking about a series on the state of startup financing tomorrow. Uh, we've got a link in the chat there. And I want to thank Nadia for taking the time out to join us on her very special book launch day. So thank you so much for, it's been such a treat for us to learn from you on your big day. Uh, so thanks for spending the time with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome.
And thanks to everyone in the community for joining today. We'll publish some takeaways on our blog and our YouTube channel. Uh, so thanks for jamming with us tonight. And we'll see you tomorrow for more conversation with Nikhil. Thank you. See you guys. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.